I'm glad you're here this morning. And those of you watching online, glad you're watching online as well. We're uh, going to talk this morning about something that Jesus said uh, to answering a question, teach us to pray. And prayer is something I would imagine everyone here does. Everyone online probably watching does as well. And if I were to um, poll you, if I were just to ask individuals, which I won't, but if I were to ask you, how's your prayer life? You know the answer I'd probably get most of the time? Fine. <laughs> Isn't that how we answer lots of questions? How are you doing? Fine. How's the weather? Oh, fine. Um, how's your prayer life? Oh, it's fine. fine. You know, and, and that's really the way we answer questions when we really want to not give too much information and we really don't want any follow-up questions. So if I asked how your prayer life was, and you would say it's rotten. <laughs> or if I, were, if I were to say, how's your prayer life? And you were to say, it's outstanding. They would almost beg for a follow-up question. So we say fine a lot of times to, to push back. And there, have, there are people in the room and online who have been praying to God for longer than I've been alive. And so you guys have been praying for a long time. And some of you have really uh, very mature and outstanding prayer lives, I'm, I'm sure. But there are others that probably have, you know, maybe been a Christian for a long time. And if you were really honest, your prayer life isn't all that it should be, probably. You look at some other people who have a great prayer life and you kind of go, what is it about them? What is it about him or her that, you know, just, they just seem like they have a really good prayer life? So the disciples were walking with Jesus over a period of time, and, and there must have come a time when, well, there's many times when they heard him pray. Jesus talked to his heavenly father often. And so they're, like any kid would sometimes, you know, when your parents are talking, you're kind of like, what are they talking about? And so these disciples probably felt that way about Jesus and his prayers. Like, did you hear what he said? Did you hear... Did, he seems like he really means it, you know, and, and there must have been some questions because then we get in, in Luke chapter 11, the very first verse, says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And I would, I don't know who it was. I almost guess it might've been Peter because the guy said, we all want to know, but we don't want to go ask him. We don't want to seem like idiots. Peter, you don't mind looking like an idiot. So why don't you go ask him? <laughs> Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, would you teach us to pray? There's a question here, too. Would you teach us to pray? We, we really want to learn. And they acknowledged by asking that question, whoever it was, probably in behalf of the group, they acknowledged that their prayer lives had some growing to do. And so we're going to look this morning at something that Jesus taught them back then. And I'm, I'm almost sure, I hate to give it a preface like this, but I will anyway. I'm going to make some of you upset, but don't blame me. Jesus said it, not me. Um, but again, I asked the question a while ago, um, fictitious question. If I were to ask you, how's your prayer life? How would you answer? And if I were to listen to you pray, go ahead and pray, you know, and, and you're to, first of all, you'd be really intimidated probably because it was me. But if I were to listen and, and if I were to say, you know, your prayer life could use some work, you'd probably be a little taken back. You probably had stopped coming to church. <laughs> That's not true. But it would, be, it would be hard to take, wouldn't it? Because most of us have learned how to pray from someone we really respected, probably from our parents. Um, you know the old, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die, really, that's what you want to teach your kid? If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, really? We prayed over meals too. You know, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. By his hands, we all are fed. Thank you for our daily bread. Amen. That's what Karen and Janet and myself learned to pray when we were kids. And so when I talk about we learned to pray that very fast sometimes, that's the prayer we prayed really fast. We didn't learn the now I lay me down to sleep. We had another one. Watch over thy little child tonight, dear Savior from above, and keep us till the morning light within thy arms of love. Bless Mommy and Daddy and Karen and Janet and Dookie and Fluffy. That was our dog and cat. And so that's, that's what we learned to pray. Now, if I were still praying like that, you would say, what's wrong with you? 
how did you ever become a pastor, right? <laughs> okay. And yet some people, sometimes, again, we've learned from our Sunday school teachers or maybe our priest or our pastor how to pray or whatever it might be, and we, we just hold on to that when we're young, young in Christ or young in age. And to be honest, a lot of Christians don't mature much beyond that. They just say this repetitive thing they've said all the time. And Jesus is going to basically knock the props out from underneath that kind of praying in just a few minutes as we get into the scripture this morning. And so I, again, I'm not trying to step on, you know, your tradition, I'm not trying to step on your mom or dad who taught you to pray or some other meaningful adult in your life. But at the same time, I'm hoping that many of you who pray simplistic, uh, not the wrong with simplistic, but just repetitive, I just pray the same prayer all the time, that you'll you'll take a second look at that and say, you know, maybe I should venture out and not just pray the same repetitive prayer I pray all the time, okay? And I can tell by some of the expressions on your face that you're kind of going, you're speaking right to me. <laughs> and again, there's nothing wrong with our, with our mothers or fathers having taught us to pray those little prayers. But like I said, that prayer for, for meals, I mean, that's really good when you're five, you know, but when you're 55, you shouldn't be praying the same prayer for meals. You should be having matured a little bit beyond that. So we're going to look at a very familiar section of Scripture this morning. We're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. And it's always fun for me as a pastor to pray and ask the Lord to lead me as I prepare my message because I realize that our group, you know, I mean, typically almost every church the same way. You've got some people who are really mature in the faith and could teach this. And we have other people who are not that mature in the faith and have no idea where the Lord's Prayer is found. Uh, other than maybe they've quoted it in church somewhere. So I'm going to try to look at some stuff that you might not have considered at least for a long time. And here's my goal, and I want to tell you this flat out. I want, I'm hoping that the Lord will use the message this morning and the Word of God to help your prayer life to grow and to focus and to be a little more specific and a little more what He wants it to be. So we're going to take a look at that. And so Jesus, again, I told you the, the verse out of uh, Luke 11. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6 for a more long look at the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to start in verse 5. And the first part of this little section I'm going to talk about is Jesus teaches us how not to pray. Now, you might want to think, you should be thinking already, okay, how do you learn to pray by learning how not to pray? Well, some of us, some of us collectively have probably done some of these things and made mistakes doing these things. And even as I was studying this and really, you know, pondering this, I've been pondering this for a couple, three weeks, getting ready for this particular message. Um, the Lord reminded me of some things that I need to do better in this as well. Here I am a pastor. I'm still learning and growing. And I hope I never stop learning and growing in Christ. Uh, one day I'll be like Jesus, but that's not going to happen until I go to be with him. Okay. You too. Amen. Jesus said this, out of the mouth of Jesus. I'm not saying this. I'm just reading Jesus' words. Here's what Christ said. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Okay, time out. The hypocrites. <laughs> All right. Now, what is a hypocrite? Okay, it's like, it's like a little crip, crip with a hippo on it, right? Okay. <laughs> a hypocrite, and, and you know you don't want to be a hypocrite. But a lot of people don't think about what it is, and I may talk more about this later as what hypocrites are. But in the old days, what happened with some of the, the Roman plays and Shakespearean plays and some of the other plays that have happened throughout eons is they would, uh, the actor or actress would have like a little mask, and they'd put the mask up here, and they'd play that role. And a hypocrite is basically someone who looks like something, but really the reality is quite different, okay? So that's what a hypocrite is. Hypocrite, I think, is used about 57 times. We find that in the New Testament, that word, hypocrite. And it's not a complimentary word. We have, um, there's hypocrites in most churches, I suppose. People who look like a Christian and act like a Christian, but really, you know, it's not, how, it's not their way of life. It's not, how they, it's not how they live. It's not how they think during the week. So he says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand praying in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Here I am, aren't I wonderful? And back then, the, uh, you know, they would put on the prayer shawl and stuff, and so you would see across the street, oh, he's praying, looking really religious and praying, and he's got his everything on, okay? That's kind of what he's talking about. They love to stand praying in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. 
And then Jesus says this, truly, I say to you. Now, whenever Jesus says truly, it means like, pay attention, this is it. And if he says truly, truly, you know you're in trouble, okay? So, and he really means this is super important. So truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Now, think about this. So these hypocrites, these, these prayers who kind of would pray, Jesus is saying here they, they've, they've said all these words and stuff, but they've received their reward in full. What does that mean? <laughs> the next little phrase said, well, well actually, uh, I, let, me, yeah, let me just finish reading that. And they, say, they pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. So they have received their reward in full. Why? Because they have been seen by others. Oh, isn't he spiritual? Isn't he just wonderful in the Lord? Look at how well he prayed. That's what the reward is that they got. And then Jesus says this, but when you pray. Okay. This seems to indicate for, at the beginning that there is a when time that you will pray. So let me ask you this question. Don't answer. When do you pray? But when you pray. So it's not if you pray, and it's not even how you pray at this point. It's when you pray. Now, here's something I need to say, because some of you have grown up, and I won't ask for a show of hands. Some of you have grown up in what I would call a legalistic church. And a legalistic church says you must do the following things to be approved by God. You must pray. Well, Another religion says you must pray X amount of times a day facing a particular direction. And, and, but some of, our, some of our churches, and I'm not pointing them out, I'm not being critical, I'm just saying some of you have grown up in legalistic churches which says you shall pray. In other words, you shall pray before each meal. Or you go straight to doo-doo, okay? <laughs> we need to be thankful, but there's really no, nothing in Scripture, nothing from the Lord that says we need to pray before every meal. I tend to pray before most of my meals, but I do it out of just a reminding myself to be thankful. And I don't, I don't have long prayers before my meals. Okay, that's just, that's just me. It's just really, really short. But at the same time, I'm having this attitude of gratitude. But it says, but when you pray, Jesus says, go into your room. Okay, so Jesus is saying that there's a, obviously there's a time to pray, that you guys need to have a time to pray. And you need to have a place to pray. And this place he's telling them to pray is in their room. Go into your room and close the door. <laughs> now, I don't know how practical that was for the disciples back then, but I'm guessing it was doable or he would not have said that. But for us who live in buildings with multiple rooms and doors on every room pretty much, it's very doable. But when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. And pray to your Father who is unseen. Now, well, let me just read the next phrase. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Okay. Now, this is important. And I won't ask for, you know, you just to regurgitate back what I just got through reading here. But Jesus is telling us to pray to the Father. Jesus is not telling us to pray to him. He's not telling us to pray to his mama. He's not telling us to pray to a saint. He's not telling us to pray to the Holy Spirit. He's telling us to pray to the Father. Let that sink in. That's from Jesus to his followers. If you're a Christian and you're a follower, that's for you too. And so for some of you, particularly, and I'm not being critical, but particularly if you've grown up, let's say, uh, Catholic or, or some other, you know, and even, even charismatic church Christians, and, and they're wonderful people too. I mean, Catholics are, can have a lot of Christians there, a lot of Christians. You know what? The Catholic Church and the Protestant Church and the Orthodox Church are the three major branches of Christianity. They're all brothers and sisters in Christ. But not everyone in the Catholic Church is born again. But not everyone in our church is born again. We probably have some people, at least online, who aren't. Not everyone who's in the Baptist church locally are born again. Okay? But we're all part of this. And some of these churches have taught you to pray to things, to people, groups, saints, whatever, other than Jesus. I'm sorry, other than God. Jesus himself tells us to pray only to our Father. And I, I mention the Jesus thing because I have a lot of friends who pray to Jesus regularly. And I've, you know, I gently just point out this scripture, but they have such a great prayer life, I'm not going to dissuade them. So if you pray to Jesus, I would not criticize you, but Jesus himself might. Okay, you following me? 
So don't get mad at me. I started the sermon by saying, don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. We have to pray to the Father, not to Jesus, not to the other things I just suggested, not to the Holy Spirit. They're all God, yes, but we're to pray to the Father. That's what he says. Then your Father, who sees in secret, I read this part again, will sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Reward you. So prayer, according to this first section here, is to be secret and it's supposed to be secure. In other words, we should go into our room by ourselves. Now, let's talk about that just for a minute. Why would you do that? Why do you think he made such a big deal out of it? I know it sounds like more of a Bible study than a preaching thing, but I'm gonna just, I'll just keep on doing what I normally do. Why did Jesus make a big deal to the disciples of go in and close your door? And here's, here's why. They, only when you're by yourself with you and God can you really be real. When no one else is around, and you can, you can talk to him, and you can listen to him. Be still and know that I am God. That's, we quote that verse a lot out of Psalm 46, but it, very few really spend much time doing that. And we need to be able to be quiet. We need to be into our room where we can really shut the door and, and not, you know, and I love my wife completely, obviously, and we pray together and we spend a lot of time together, but there are times that I need to be by myself with God and her the same way. We just need that. And so we need to be able to go into our, and you, can, you don't have to necessarily go into a room. You could take a walk out into the, the forest or out into the, around the lake here or something, and you could be by yourself. The key, I think, is to be by yourself with you and God. And here's, a, here's an important one, no electronics. It is so challenging today for many of us to stay away from the electronics. In fact, they're talking about depression that's starting to happen because people are not getting out into nature enough because we're all tied up by being entertained with our phones and our pads and our whatever else we've got, electronics, you know, including the, including the boob tube in front of us. We don't call it that much anymore, do we? But that's kind of what it is. Okay, so, so keep that in mind. So th I could probably start, stop here, and probably half of you are going to feel really guilty, like, oh, man, all right. Pastor, you've already beat me up. I, you know, I don't do that. Yeah, it's not me. I'm not beating you up. I'm just sharing what Jesus shared, okay? Okay, so that's only one part, and I've got 27 parts this morning. <laughs> and then we go to verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. Blah, 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 blah. I know. For some, for, there are people who probably are listening online, and they're, you know, maybe they've turned me off already because they said, he just babbles. <laughs> well, I hopefully don't just babble, but the point he's making is that even like the prayers I mentioned before that Karen and I prayed when we were children at home, those prayers can be just said over and over and over and over and over. And, and what happens with repeated prayers like that is you no longer think about them. You don't think about the words. You don't think about what they meant. Maybe the first few times, boy, that really sunk. But after the 400th time of saying that, you, know, you just do it out of rope. And that's what he was criticizing here. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. A little side trip here into Luke chapter 18, the parable. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. You, I'm sure you've heard this story. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I get. That's what he said in the parable. Then Jesus goes on. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The total number of words you pray are not important to God, but humility is. Now back to Matthew, chapter 6, verse 7. Again, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Batelageto is the Greek word here, and I put that in, batelageto, because it sounds like babbling, doesn't it? <laughs> babbling, batelageto, OK? 
Okay, so it just kind of it just kind of flows. Sometimes the Greek has doesn't look anything like what the English equivalent is, but this time it did. He goes on in verse eight. Jesus is speaking. He says, "Do not be like them." What's that? Babbling like pagans and lots and lots of words, lots and lots of words. So for some of you who think, you know, if you've ever read like the life of of Calvin or you know, Zwingli or Luther or some of these, you know, the guys, Protestantism, where they started. You know, you, oh, I got up at four in the morning and they spent the first four hours in prayer. Holy moly, they didn't have TV. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I used to get, I used to feel guilty about that. I said like, wow, you know, look at all the time they spent in prayer. Jim, how much time did you spend in prayer? Well, not four hours. And he says, they, so when you pray, do not keep babbling. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For, for, and, and here Jesus, a great teacher, Jesus uses this word for, I think, to create a tension there. You know, they're, they're listening to him, and then it's like for, and it's kind of like hanging on his next words, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Wow, that should be really comforting as we think about prayer. God knows our need. Father God knows our need before you ask him. So that raises the question, then why pray? So prayer to most people, unfortunately, is informing God about what's going on with me. It's like, okay, God, I want to tell you what I'm facing or about something I want or something I wish for or something I desire. Um, or for us, or for, it's a, it basically, for a lot of people, prayer is telling God about what we're, what we're wanting, what we're needing, what we're thinking, what we're feeling. And here's the deal. God already knows. Okay, he already knows. And so then the question is, so if God already knows, then why pray? Why pray? It's because Jesus prayed. He taught his followers to pray. And last week, we talked about ask A-S-K, ask, seek, and knock out of Matthew chapter 7. And, and here's something I want you to kind of, kind of write in your, your thinking. We don't pray because we have to. God is not commanding us to pray. Jesus is not commanding us to pray, but he's giving us an invitation to pray to the Father. We're invited to pray because we're his children. That should, that should like, wow. I, I want you to get that child father thing down, okay, because that's, that's important. When we pray to the Father, we're praying to God who already knows what we need, but he invites us to come and pray and talk to him because he loves us so much. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I did it out of the New Living. And um, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So we pray because we've been invited to pray by the Lord. Next, then Jesus continues on his teaching on how to pray. Verse 9. Now this is now we get into the part that you're really more familiar with in terms of the Lord's Prayer. But I really wanted to start with the stuff not to do because that's the stuff we don't typically cover. The things not to do and how to you know, again, get alone by yourself and get into your room, shut the door, just you and the Lord, just you and, and God the Father. Then he teaches us how to pray. Verse 9, chapter 6. Then this is how you should pray. By the way, some of you probably know this, but there's bound to be a few who don't, maybe online, maybe here. We often refer to this prayer as the Lord's Prayer. It's really the disciples' prayer, the followers' prayer. Uh, Jesus did not pray this prayer, okay? But if you want to see a Jesus prayer, and there's six prayers in the New Testament that Jesus prayed, one of the best, the best, the high priestly prayer is John chapter 17. But this one, we call the disciples, it should be the disciples prayer. We refer to it the Lord's prayer. It's been going on too many centuries for us to, to change the, everyone's belief of what it's called, but it's really not Jesus' prayer. It's what he taught his disciples. So, this is how you should pray. And then we'll do, I'll do this out of the King James because that's how most of us have, have learned it and recited, re, recited it through all these years. Our Father, which art in heaven. So Jesus says that the best way for us to start our prayers 
is remembering our relationship with God the Father. You talked about that earlier in terms of, you know, God uh, and the Father and, and what he said earlier. But here it says, our Father which art in heaven. And the best way for us to, I guess, to really get a hold of this is to um, remember in whose image we're made, in whose image we're made, and to see him as our perfect Heavenly Father. Now, this is hard for some people. I mentioned this last week. I'll mention it again this week. It's hard for some people, and, and probably some folks here, and maybe some folks online, because some of you are carrying what I would call father wounds with you. You have been hurt by your earthly father somehow, sometime, some way. And those hurts oftentimes cause us to push away from our Heavenly Father, because we're using the word father. And so we kind of like, okay, this just all kind of makes sense. This, you know, I just, I don't think I can really do that. And so my encouragement to you, of course, is to bring those, those challenges, those thoughts, those hurts to God. Bring it to him in prayer. Lord, you know, I'm, I'm hurting. I, you know, I, I need to get over this. I need your help to get over this. But our Father, which art in heaven, he is our perfect heavenly Father. Now, Debbie and I were blessed with good fathers when we grew up. And we really were. And I'm thankful for that. And I, uh, I try and hope uh, I have been a good father and I try to be a good grandfather, uh, but I, I know that's not always the norm. Uh, I will say this too, that one of my grandsons who won't be watching, which I'm glad about this, um, <laughs> he's 19 and uh, almost 20 here and uh, I don't know, six to seven months ago, he was dating this gal and um, he uh, contacted me without his mother knowing and he said, do you have any good book you can recommend in preparation for marriage? I said, sure. So I bought him a book, sent him two copies, one for him, one for her, called 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged by H. Norman Wright. This is not an advertisement for the book, but he's a Christian counselor who I had uh, in, a, in a psych class when I was in seminary. And so uh, they started going through this. And it's interesting, again, I'm telling you more than you need to know, but since he won't be watching anyway, I guess I can. Um, after they started this, they started going through it. I asked them how it was going. It was coming along pretty good. And then they broke up. <laughs> but they're back together again, but at a, a little simpler level. So I'm, I'm guessing there was something in there, and, and you've been through marriage. You know, all, many of you have been married. All of you have been married probably. And it's like, you know, there was something in there, and he, you know, it, it affected his college major. He says, you know, I think I want to get something where after four years I can, get a, I can get a good job rather than having to go to graduate school. And I'm sitting here going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So anyway, I just share that. Oh, I'll share something also, too. Uh, just <laughs> you, can put, you can put this away in your calendar. On September the 16th, which is a Saturday in here, uh, we're going to, I, we have just uh, made contact with and are going to have a Christian Grandparenting Network speaker come and do an all-day seminar in little chunks for grandparents, how to, be a, how to be a better grandparent, how to be a strong Christian grandparent and to influence. These guys, these guys write books. They do seminars all over. And I figured the best thing to do is just to invite them in, pay their fee, and have everybody here who wants to learn more about that. So that's in September. That'll be after the fall starts. I, well, fall, I don't know when fall starts, September. Anyway, September the 16th is what we have, we have books. So more on that down the road. But I just completed that connection this week. So it's like it's on my, it's on my thinking. This is then how you should pray, our Father in heaven. Then the next phrase, which is really a key phrase that most of us just run by quickly when we quote the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This phrase, hallowed be thy name, should cause us to pause and remind ourselves of who we're praying to. Who are we praying to? Are we praying to the ceiling? We're praying to the guy next door. We're praying to Yahweh, God, the uncreated creator. I put down a few things from last week's message of who and what God is. God is ultimate strength. He's ultimate righteousness. He's ultimate goodness. He's ultimate wisdom. He's ultimate love. He's ultimate knowledge. He is sovereign, which means he answers to no one. He's omniscient, which means he knows everything. He's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere present at once. He's omnipotent. We know him in the Bible as Jehovah, Adonai, Lord, 
Yahweh. He is the uncreated creator of everything that exists anywhere in the universe. The uncreated creator. And he's more. So when we say hallowed be thy name, we're really talking about holy, um, pure, all-knowing, all of these things. Hallowed be thy name. And we rush by that, just like our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kind of like we used to rush through our prayer for meals when we were kids sometimes. And I really want to not have you rush through that anymore. I really want to encourage you to remember who we're praying to because what it does is it, when we have a problem, okay, we have this mountain in our life, something came up, a health report, something with a, a loved one's going on that's wrong, some other kind of issue that's a problem, it, the thing grows and grows and grows and becomes like a gigantic mountain. And we go, I'm desperate. I guess I'm going to have to pray. <laughs> and as we pray, as we, as we pray, and if we do it right, and if we think about who we're praying to, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, even if you just did just that part and focused on that, we would realize how big God is. And it makes our mountain look smaller. And as we focus behind the mountain on God, we eventually get, we're, we're looking at God the Father. This mountain almost is like, <laughs> it's penny ante. It doesn't really mean much. It's not a big deal. God can take care of it. Has anything changed in our health because of us talking to the Father? Not necessarily. Has anything changed in our situation? Not necessarily. But now we know we're connected with the Father who has all power, all capability, and can do something. And he starts by calming his child. All those of us who have had children, there have been times when they've been afraid. I remember when we were, I'd get afraid sometimes, and I'd go into the bedroom where mom and dad was. I'm a little kid, and crawl into bed with them. <sighs> I'm safe. That's how you feel. And that's how we should feel with our Heavenly Father. We're safe because he knows. Hallowed be thy name. And although I do believe, and I've said before, that we can talk to God, we can pray anytime, any place, about anything, it's hard, or I should say it's easier to get a grasp of hallowed be thy name when you're in your room by yourself or maybe you're out walking among the trees by yourself and you're just thinking about how great God is. It's easier to do that than when you're on the freeway at 65, 75 miles an hour. And we can pray then too, <laughs> okay? Oh God, let that not be a red light in my mirror. You know, <laughs> you see, that's another advantage to make carving out this time where you can be alone with your Father, with your Heavenly Father. Get alone with God. Again, when we, when we pause and reflect upon who God is, we get, gain a better understanding of who we are and who we're praying to. And I think that's one of the things that the enemy of our faith tries to trick us out of, is he doesn't want us to realize how big our God is. He wants us to think God, God doesn't care. He didn't answer my prayer, so I guess he's not there. He doesn't care. That's what the enemy wants us to do. The enemy has been trying to trick people out of their faith in God since Adam and Eve. He's been doing that. So the other thing, too, about this particular verse is it really... This part of prayer is where we reset our perspective on God, the world, and who we are. Let me say that again. Focusing on this section is where we reset our perspective on God, who we are, and the world. And we all need that. Because think about it, we are all bombarded. Even if you're not a television junkie, and I'm not a television junkie, but at the same time, you know, just even reading, reading uh, the news feeds about what's going on, it makes me kind of really wonder about what's going on. And it's times like that when I have to kind of remind myself of who my Heavenly Father is. And I go to Him and I can talk to Him and I can be comforted. There, there, my child. You're, I'll, I'll be with you. I'm with you. You see, our lives are significant because of whose image we bear. Catch that. Our lives are significant because of whose image we bear and whose children we are. And so if we miss this part, this hallowed be thy name part, we'll miss what follows. It's really important for us to grab onto this. 
And you know intuitively that what I'm saying to you is truth, and it's what Jesus said, but I'm just also telling you that the, the typical MO of the typical Christian is to rush by this part and not really give who God is full, full sway. The purpose of prayer. He continues then, and he says this. After this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here's the next part, verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, you know what a lot of people think, and you wouldn't tell me. I wouldn't ask anyway. A lot of people think, well, what about me? What about me? Reminds me of our dog. We have a two-year-old golden retriever, and for her, life is all about me. Me, let's throw the ball. Come on. What's with you people? I, that's why you exist, <laughs> to take care of me. <laughs> and sometimes Christians, when they're young in the faith, they could be 70 years old and young in the faith. Sometimes Christians, when they're young in the faith, really think that prayer is all about them and all about what's going on with them. I mean, the way a lot of people pray is they go, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Here's my list. I got to go. <laughs> and <laughs> that just totally blows all the other stuff that Jesus has been talking about out of the water. And so the what about me thing is, is important. But here, here, Jesus has already answered that in verse 8. He says, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask. Remember that part in verse 8? So the point of prayer, catch this, don't miss this. The point of prayer is for us to realign ourselves with God's will and God's purpose, God's plan. The purpose of prayer is for us to surrender our will, not impose it. Catch that. The purpose of prayer is to surrender our will, not try to impose ours on God. He is not, as I mentioned last week, he is not a vending machine. He is not an ATM machine that if we put in the right code numbers, then he just gives us whatever we ask for. And I'm glad that uh, he doesn't. And I talked about that last week. So a way to start your prayers might be, Heavenly Father, um, before I ask anything, I want to know what it is that you want. Okay? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's like we're, we're sometimes, and all of us are like this, we're like little kids in a candy store. You know, I remember when the malls used to have these candy stores. I don't know if they still do. And it's like, oh, I want some of that, and I want some of that, and I want some of that. And God says, that's, Jesus is teaching here that that's not how you approach God the Father. We approach God the Father with, he already knows what you need, so approach him and remember who he is. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Now, what, what was in the balance? What, what hung in the balance of that prayer, that conversation that Jesus had with his father? What hung in the balance? You and me and salvation of the world. Yet not my will, but yours be done. The entire world hung in the balance of Jesus submitting himself to the will of the father knowing what was up ahead. Charles Stanley, who, beloved pastor who we just all lost, I imagine if I asked for a show of hands, most of you would go up, yeah, I know Charles Stanley, I listened to him, I've got several books on my shelf from him, those kinds of things. He said this, he said, kneeling, which is an idea for some of you to pray from time to time, and again, I'm not suggesting you have to do this to get it, to get it right, and for some of you, you might not want to do that, okay? Because it might, you might have to call 911 to get up. I mean, I'm not... <laughs> But kneeling is a sign of submission. And this is a Charles Stanley quote. Kneeling is a sign of submission. Father, I submit to your will, your plan, even if it conflicts with my own. I know I'll find joy and happiness by following your plan for my life. Wow. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will, Father, for my life, for my family, for my relationships, for my business. And until we surrender to his will, we're really just consumers. We're just consumers. Seeing God, as I said a second ago, kind of as a vending machine, and he is not that. Now, for some of you, and maybe some online, there's some of you who, who might have said, you know, I just stopped praying. I just stopped praying to God. 
So what does that say about you then? Sometimes, again, people stop praying because, well, he didn't answer my prayer. Okay? I understand. But what if Jesus was correct? What if, what if our Heavenly Father was not that, was not a vending machine, was not like, okay, here's my list. I got to go, Father, take care of all these things. What if that was, he's not that? What if his plan includes you but doesn't center on you? What if his plan is bigger than you but includes you? My last little section, a key to prayers that work. What if, the question I would ask you to think about is, what if prayers that work don't begin with asking, but they begin with recognizing and submitting? Let me say that again. What if prayers that work do not begin with asking, but they begin with recognizing who God is and submitting to his plan? Thy will be done on, he on earth as it is in heaven. What if we're supposed to begin each day by recognizing again his will and acknowledging that it takes priority in my life that day? Sometimes, as I talk to people, I have thought this through the years, I mean, Sometimes people try to pray themselves out of a difficult situ situation that they behave themselves into. And I'm thinking that perhaps the solution would have been for them to align themselves with God's will to begin with and wouldn't have messed up. Yes, we can talk to God anywhere, anytime, anyplace. I mentioned that before. But this type of prayer, this, just this part right here, is what I can all consider fundamental it's foundational. It's a way we should start each and every day to put our life on, on the right track. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come to you in prayer. Let, let this sink in deeply to all of us. What, what we've covered this morning, Father, is so profound and yet so simple and yet so often missed in all of our lives. So, Lord, uh, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray to our Father. Teach us to spend more time in our room with a closed door or someplace where we can be alone with you. Turn off the electronics and just talk to you and, and realize who you are and praise you for who you are. Lord, we want, to, we want to pray better. We need it for ourselves. We need it to honor you. We need it for our country and our world. We want to be part of your plan we want to follow your plan. We want to follow your will. We can't impose our own on you. That does neither of us any good. Father, you are your God. You're the Almighty. You made it all. And your Holy Spirit has been with us as we've talked and shared this morning. Help each of us to remember some of the things that have been said this morning that pertain to us. And help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.